Now take Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Okay, so Nadab and, and you Abihu shall make holy garments sons. for Aaron your brother, for glory and for beauty. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe. Minister to God? What does that mean? I thought you minister to the people. 28 4 doesn't say what is that I'm sure that doesn't mean like anything crazy um exodus Twenty-eight. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just probably reading into it too much. A skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister to me as priest. They shall take the gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and the fine linen, and they shall make the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, artistically worked. It shall have two shoulder straps joined at God its two stylish, edges, man. and so it shall be joined together. And the intricately woven band of the ephod, which is on it, shall be of the same workmanship, made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen. Then you shall take two onyx stones, and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and six names on the other stone, in order of their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in settings of gold. And you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. What is the ephod? So Aaron shall bear the... Ephod was a type of apron worn by the Jewish high priests in Kohen Gadol. Is this the ephod right here with all the jewels? Um, where are we in this? Where does it say ephod? Here. And you shall put two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones. Yeah, so the apron, so the full thing, not just the chest piece. Okay, here's here, the two stones on the shoulders. Right? You know what this always reminded me of? This right here. This right here. <laughs> it's always reminded me of that. Right? <laughs> Their names right, before going. the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. You shall also make settings of gold, and you shall make two chains of pure gold like braided cords, and fasten the braided chains to the settings. You shall make the breastplate of judgment, artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, purple, judgment. and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, you shall make it. 
it shall be doubled into a square. A span shall be its length, and a span shall be its width. And you shall put settings of stones in it, four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and an emerald. This shall be the first row. The second row shall be a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. Mm, the third row, correct. a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one with its own name. They shall be according to the twelve tribes. You shall make chains for the breastplate at the end, like braided cords of pure gold. And you shall make two rings of gold for the breastplate, and put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. Then you shall put the two braided chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the two braided chains you shall fasten to the two settings, and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in the front. You shall make two rings of gold, and put them on the two ends of the breastplate, on the edge of it, which is on the inner side of the ephod. And two other rings of gold you shall make, and put them on the two shoulder straps underneath the ephod, toward its front, right at the seam above the intricately woven band of the ephod. They shall bind the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the ephod, using a blue cord, so that it is above the intricately woven band of the ephod, and so that the breastplate does not come loose from the ephod. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So... That. The Urim... Where is that? Urim and the Thummim. Urim and Thummim. Over his heart, though. He holds them over his heart. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. You shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue, there shall be an opening for his head in the middle of it. It shall have a woven binding all around its opening, like the opening in a coat of mail, so that it does not tear. And upon its hem, you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet. Where is the Urim and the... And you shall put on in the, bre in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart. But what about all the st other stones? I don't know. I'm not seeing any uh What are the Urim and the Thummim? Israel's high priest was commanded to carry two things called the Urim and the Thummim. What are they and what did they symbolize? What is their purpose? When did they stop being used? The King James Old Testament refers to the Urim and the Thummim in only seven passages. The first place it is mentioned is in the book of Exodus in relation to the unique and special clothing worn by the high priest of Israel. Alright, we just read that. Okay, okay, but what is it? 
Attached to the ephod via chains of gold was a breastplate, also referred to as a breastplate of judgment in Exodus 28.30, which had embedded in had embedded in it precious stones arranged in four rows with three stones in each row. Each stone put in a setting was put in a setting of gold, and each had one of the names of the tribes of Israel engraved upon it. The Bible does not directly state which tribe was engraved on each stone. However, the first hist- century the first century historian Josephus states the stones were labeled according to the birth of birth order of Israel's male children. The Urim and the Thummim were stored in a pouch sewn into the breastplate, which was placed directly over the priest's heart. They were put in this location to be a memorial from the Lord. Exodus twenty eight twenty nine. Well it didn't expi- explicitly say that, but I'm assuming that's probably where it was, right? Where else would you put it? It can be on top where thought where all the other stones are. So it makes sense that it is probably sewed in there somewhere. All around its hem, and bells of gold between them, all around. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, upon the hem of the robe, all around. And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, and its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord. You shall make a robe of the ephod all blue. A pomegranate. I spell pomegranate. That's not how you spell pomegranate. Like that. Is that a pomegranate? Like that, see? It's got to be, can be literally pomegranates. <laughs> uh. Well, that's cool. So the, the Thummim and the Urim will probably be inside here somewhere over his heart. Lord. And when he comes out, that he may not die. You shall also make a plate of pure gold. And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, and its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, that he may not die. Okay, so they know that it's Aaron, right? Because they'll probably kill anybody else that goes in there, I'm assuming. Uh, let's see, 35, 28, 35. Doesn't say. Okay, I'm assuming that's probably what it is. Because it, why would like God not kill him? Because he knows that, okay, he hears the bell, so it's Aaron, right? It's probably for the people. I mean, God obviously knows. And engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And you shall put it on a blue cord, that it may be on the turban. It shall be on the front of the turban. So it shall be on Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall always be on his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. You shall skillfully weave the tunic of fine linen thread. You shall make the turban of fine linen, and you shall make the sash of woven work. For Aaron's sons, you shall make tunics, and you shall make sashes for them, and you shall make hats for them for glory and beauty. So you shall put them on Aaron your brother and on his sons with him. You shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister to me as priests. And you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They shall reach from the waist to the thighs. They shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they come into the tabernacle of meeting 
or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, that they do not incur iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever to him and his descendants after him. And this is what you shall do to them. So God is definitely a designer. A designer and a creator. To hallow them for ministering to me as priests. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil. You shall make them of wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket with the bull and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and you shall wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments, put the tunic on Aaron and the robe of the ephod, the ephod and the breastplate, and gird him with the intricately woven band of the ephod. You shall put the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. And you shall take the anointing oil, pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put tunics on them. And you shall gird them with sashes, Aaron and his sons, and put the hats on them. The priesthood shall be theirs for a perpetual statute. So you shall consecrate Aaron and his sons. You shall also have the bull brought before the tabernacle of meeting, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the bull. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. You shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and pour all the blood beside the base of the altar. And you shall take all the fat that... Why do you think um, God had all these uh, ritualistic type things in play? <clears throat> in place. And then Jesus comes along and does away with all of these ritualistic type things and breaks, and, you know, breaks all the superfluous type of stuff and boils it down to faith you know right because like what is the purpose is it to build is it to uh it's like because they're doing all this they're invested right and they're invested in god and obeying God, so you you build that sort of relationship that way, right? Because these people just came from Egypt, right? As slaves, and they've been wandering around for years, and they need some sort of structure and some sort of <clears throat> something that they can they know that they're they can be held accountable to, right? So maybe maybe in that way. What do you guys think? Let me know down in the comment section. That's that's sort of an interesting uh, topic to discuss. Covers the entrails, the fatty lobe attached to the liver, and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them, and burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull, with its skin and its offal, you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. You shall also take one ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall kill the ram, and you shall take its blood and sprinkle it all around on the altar. Then you shall cut the ram in pieces, wash its entrails and its legs, and put them with its pieces and with its head, and you shall burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. 
you shall also take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands on the head of the ram. Also, do you think um, the tabernacle and the clothes and the Ark of the Covenant and all that stuff, right? Do you think that could become an idol of sorts, right? I mean, they're not God, but you can put so much value on these material objects, right? And that would that make you lose focus? Or would you rely on a material object to express your love for God onto? Meaning like, <clears throat> like the value of that, like let's say the Ark of the Covenant, right? That thing can get crushed into pieces and it shouldn't affect you in the sense that it's not God, right? It's just some wood with gold leaf over it, right? I mean, the reason why you should hold it in high, at high regard is because God told you to. There's nothing inherently valuable besides, I mean, the gold and all that stuff, but, you know, valuable to God about the Ark of the Covenant. And I'm sure there were people that looked at it, looked at the Ark of the Covenant as something godly, right? Even though it was, they just literally chopped up some trees and made it and found some gold in the ground and, and you know, or f some of the gold that they took from Egypt. Like, you know, you know, you know what I'm getting at? Because God didn't want any, you know, in the Ten Commandments, no graven images or anything like that. But I'm curious if, like, the Ark of the Covenant and all that stuff could become something like that. You know? Let me know your thoughts. I'm curious to see. Then you shall kill the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tip of the right ear of his sons, on the thumb of their right hand, and on the big toe of their right foot. Yeah, see, what happens if you put it on the right ear? I mean, the left ear, you know? Like, why so precise? I mean, it has to be just like a test of the people, right? To obey God. Right? To show their faith, show their commitment. It has to be something like that, right? Because if you're being so, if if I was a priest and I'm being so meticulous about, you know, where I put the blood on the right ear and the right big toe and all that stuff, you're going to start to hold that ritual at a high regard because you're being so meticulous about it. And by holding that ritual at a high regard, you're going to hold God at a high regard because he's the one who told you to do it. Right? Why else would God tell you to be so specific? That means he wants something so specific. That means it's a serious thing, and God is serious. So, I think that's the reason. Let me know what you think. I think that would have to be the reason. Because, I mean, just because you put blood on your right ear, doesn't mean you're going to heaven, you know? It's not like, I don't see how that can be important, right? Like how Jesus said, um, anything that a man puts inside his body, it, it can't defile him, right? It's not going to defile him. You got to look back and that's look back at the bigger picture, right? All these are very minute, small picture, you know, type of things. Jesus taught us to to pull back and look at the big picture. So I'm I'm guessing the reason why all this is happening <clears throat> is to is to build that faith and trust and accountability to God. And sprinkle the blood all around on the altar. And you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments, on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him. 
and he and his garments shall be hallowed, and his sons and his sons' garments with him. Also, you shall take the fat of the ram, the fat tail, the fat that covers the entrails, the fatty lobe attached to the liver, the two kidneys and the fat on them, the right thigh, for it is a ram of consecration, one loaf of bread, one cake made with oil, and one wafer from the basket of the unleavened bread that is before the Lord. And you shall put all these in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons, and you shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. You shall receive them back from their hands and burn them on the altar as a burnt offering, as a sweet aroma before the Lord. It is an offering made by fire to the Lord. Then you shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wave it as a wave offering before the Lord. And Did it shall be this your to this day? portion. These and from the ram of the consecration, I mean, they don't offer, you they shall don't consecrate offer the breast of the wave offering which is waved, and the thigh of the heave offering which is raised, of that which is for Aaron, and of that which is for his sons. It shall be from the children of Israel, for Aaron and his sons, by a statute forever. For it is a heave offering. It shall be a heave offering from the children of Israel, Okay, a wave offering is when you wave the thing in the air, right? Put them in your hands and you wave them and that's the wave offering. What is a heave offering? And from the ram of the consecration, you shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering, which is waved, and the thigh of the heave offering, which is raised, of that which is for Aaron and that which is for his sons. And it shall be from the children of Israel for Aaron and his sons by a statute forever. For it is a heave. What is a heave offering, though? 26. The word translated heave offering means something held up before the Lord. And now the translation of this word is contribution. Okay, that makes sense because it did say something about holding up, right? lift up or something it said oh and the heave offering which is raised oh, that's yeah from the sacrifices of their peace offerings that is their heave offering to the lord and the holy garments of aaron shall be his sons after him to be anointed in them and to be consecrated in them that son who becomes priest in his place shall put them on for seven days when he enters the tabernacle of meeting to minister in the holy place. And you shall take the ram of the consecration and boil its flesh in the holy place. Then Aaron and his sons shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. They shall eat those things with which the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them. But an outsider shall not eat them because they are holy. And if any of the flesh of the consecration offerings or of the bread remains until the morning, then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. Thus you shall do to Aaron and his sons according to all that I have commanded you. Seven days you shall consecrate them, and you shall offer a bull every day as a sin offering for atonement. You shall cleanse the altar when you make atonement for it, and you shall anoint it to sanctify it. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and sanctify it and the altar shall be most holy. Whatever touches the altar must be holy. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs of the first year. Do you think they put stuff on the altar just to make it holy? Like they'll touch it like, oh look, I'm holy now. You think they'd mess around like that? Some kids probably heard about it and threw their little wooden toy on there and like, hey, I have a holy toy now. 
day by day continually. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. With the one lamb shall be one-tenth of an ephah of flour, mixed with one-fourth of a hin of pressed oil, and one-fourth of a hin of wine, as a drink offering. And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and you shall offer with it the grain offering and the drink offering, as in the morning, for a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak with you. And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. You shall make an altar to burn incense on. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its width. It shall be square, and two cubits shall be its height. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. And you shall overlay its top, its sides all around, and its horns with pure gold. And you shall make for it a molding of gold all around. Two gold rings you shall make for it, under the molding on both its sides. You shall place them on its two sides, and they will be holders for the poles with which to bear it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. And you shall put it before the veil that is before the Ark of the Testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the Testimony, where I will meet with you. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer strange incense on it, or a burnt offering, or a grain offering, nor shall you pour a drink offering on it. And Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year he shall make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. When you take the census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord when you number them, that there may be no plague among them when you number them. This is what everyone among those who are numbered shall give, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is twenty giras. The half shekel shall be an offering to the Lord. Everyone included among those who are numbered from twenty years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when you give an offering to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. And you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel. Okay, so it's not a percentage based on your income. It's just... Um, everybody's giving the exact same amount. Interesting. Half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 geras. But I'm assuming half a shekel is not a lot, right?
We give 10%, Christians give 10% to God, right? I think that's what Jesus said. And half a shekel, I'm just curious how much is half a, the value of half a shekel? Okay, in today's, in terms of today's money, what would be the biblical value of half a shekel? Maimonides writes laws of Shekalim. I'm guess oh this is Jewish, okay. That the half shekel mentioned in the Torah, the annual contribution every Jew was required to give to the temple coffers, is equal to one hundred sixty grains of barley, which in modern measurements would be approximately eight grams of silver. It is impossible to know silver's value in biblical times. However, today's rate of approximate seventeen US dollars per ounce Eight grams of silver is around five dollars. Not bad, not bad. And shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of meeting, that it may be a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. You shall also make a laver of bronze, with its base also of bronze, for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. And you shall put water in it, for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. And it shall be a statute forever to them, to him and his descendants throughout their generations. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses. Also take for yourself quality spices, 500 shekels of quality liquid myrrh, spices. half as much sweet-smelling cinnamon, 250 shekels, 250 shekels of sweet-smelling cane, 500 shekels of kasha, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hin of olive oil. And you shall make from these a holy anointing oil, an ointment compounded according to the art of the... What is the holy oil made out of? Also take yourself quality spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh. Sweet smelling cinnamon, sweet smelling cane, cassia. What is cassia? Cassia is a genus flowering plant. Is a genus of flowering plants in the legume family. Cassia and cinnamon both come from the bark of a tree that is a member of the laurel f to the laurel f of the laurel family. What does cassia smell like? Very similar to cinnamon. Okay. Where is it? Cassia, olive oil, and that's it. Okay. Interesting. Perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it, you shall like. anoint the tabernacle of meeting and the ark of the testimony, the table and all its utensils, the lampstand and its utensils, and the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the laver and its base. You shall consecrate them, that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them must be holy. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons, and consecrate them, that they may minister to me as priests. And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. 
It shall not be poured on man's flesh, nor shall you make any other like it, according to its composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, or whoever puts any of it on an outsider, shall be cut off from his people. Take uh -oh. sweet spices, stack tea I feel like, and arnica. I feel like people would have followed this just because I want to know what it smelled like, right? I feel like somebody already made it. Galbanum and pure frankincense with these sweet spices. There shall be equal amounts of each. You shall make of these an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. But as for the incense... Stacte or Nietzsche, what are these? Was th were these used in cooking? Is that how it's misspelled? Stacte. What am I writing? Stacte and Nataf are names used for one component of the Solomon's Temple incense. It was a sweet spice used by the Jewish incense. Stacte. Onicha. Onika. Another sweet spice. Fingernail like operculum or trapdoor of certain sea snails. What? What? It consists of shells of several kinds of mussels, which, w when burned, emit a strong odor. So I'm guessing they didn't cook with this, right? Galbanum. An aromatic gum resin. Okay. And pure frankincense. We know what frankincense is. An aromatic resin in incense and perfumes obtained from trees of the genus Boswellia in the family of uh, Bursacare. 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 Bursarakai. Which you shall make, you shall not make any for yourselves according to its composition. It shall be to you holy for the Lord. Whoever makes any like it to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. That's crazy. All right, that's it. We finished chapter. 28 to 30 and uh, we're going to jump into 31 tomorrow tomorrow we're going to jump into 31 and what is tomorrow let's get a sneak peek artisans for building the tabernacle okay yeah those were all just the plans and everything for the tabernacle now we're going to actually build it okay all right let me know. We ha I had some questions. I mean, I we looked at some stuff. I'm gonna put those links in the in the description so you guys can reference them. But uh, if you know uh, about any of the questions and stuff that I asked, let me know down in the comment section. We can start a discussion. That's what this channel is about. All right. So uh, let me know your thoughts, and I will see you guys later. Take care.